Um, so the title of my talk today is Atoms and Photons um, from Fundamental Physics to Quantum Technology. And uh, since I have this word quantum technology on uh, my title slide, I thought it's worth um, first um, emphasizing the exciting fact that we really are entering um, an era of what we might call a quantum advantage, where a select few different physical platforms are reaching the regime um, where the quanti these quantum mechanical systems cannot be described on classical computers. Calculating what will happen in some system of um, 50, 60 quantum bits is something that would take um, uh, an, an extraordinary amount of time, um, impossible to do on a classical computer, but you can build these systems in the lab and start to play with them and hopefully sometime soon do something useful with them. So some of the systems um, where this has been achieved or is perhaps about to achieved are um, superconducting circuits, systems of um, uh, photonic systems, or systems of atoms or ions uh, that are levitated in the lab. And these in particular, these kinds of systems I've drawn here on, on the left, um, are ones where we're at a time where there are processors with anywhere from 50 to 250 qubits um, that are individually um, detectable. Uh, eight fidelities are above 99%. And it's possible to prepare highly non-classical states like this Schrodinger cat state depicted here, um, where, so this is an illustration of an experiment that was done a couple of years ago with um, uh, trapped atoms that are strongly interacting with their neighbors in such a way that um, only ever, every other atom in this chain can be in the excited state. Um, but the system is in a quantum superposition um, uh, of two possible configurations where it's 10101 and so forth, or 01010. So those are equally possible configurations. We have no idea which of the two states the system is in, but they're somehow macroscopically distinct. Um, so this is an example. Um, of something that has been done um, currently already at the level of 20 atoms and starts to illustrate the level of um, the high degree of control over quantum systems that are being realized in the lab. Um, I gave this example of um, trapped atoms um, because it's one that, well, I work with in my lab, but also that um, I would argue has had a particularly exciting kind of trajectory over the past few years where it has become possible in a few labs around the world, and these are actually not pictures from my lab, but in a few labs around the world, to really um, individually trap atoms, um, each one at the focus of a laser beam, um, individually detect them, individually manipulate them, um, position them in ordered arrays of up to hundreds of these atoms. And it's a really remarkable platform in terms of the combination of, at the, on the one hand, having control of these single particles, each of which can encode a quantum bit, um, but also a high degree of scalability. And many of these tools um, for having this high degree of control of, of, of such a quantum system were actually originally motivated um, and continue to be applied um, uh, in, in one area of precision measurements, for example. So um, why do we want such high control of atoms? One reason is that the very best clocks are made of, of, of these actually um, optically trapped atoms. Um, so these clocks, if you had started them when the universe started, they would be off by less than a second today. Um, so that's one direction that's explored with these systems. Did I see someone unmute themselves? I saw John unmute himself. No, mistake. No question? Is there a question? No. Okay. Um, I I, I want to make sure that if there are questions, you feel free to ask because it will be more fun than talking to an empty screen. Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, right, great. So precision measurements of time, one application of these systems, um, I, uh, as I kind of alluded to on the previous slide, one goal with these systems is ultimately building a universal quantum computer. Um, and these degrees of individual particle control and scalability are, are two of the ingredients that one needs. Um, but short of that, uh, some of the kind of mirror applications that are being explored with these systems are in the area of um, analog simulation. So can you build model systems that aren't yet solving, solving arbitrary computational problems, but that are well designed to address some certain class of problems that naturally map onto the hardware. So that could mean um, 
um, positioning atoms in such a way uh, in such a way that they mimic electrons in the crystalline structure of a material and solving problems from material science ranging from trying to understand um, superconductivity to magnetism. So um, those are a few directions that are being explored with these systems and particularly for these kind of latter examples of uh, computation and simulation, in addition to having a high degree of control over um, single particles, it's also important to have control over interactions. Um, so interactions are the mechanism for implementing quantum gates um, or for realizing um, quantum systems uh, where the physics um, cannot be calculated, um, the complexity arises from the interactions between the particles. Um, and so in a couple of examples I've shown here, um, here are a few different examples of atoms that are trapped in some sort of a lattice structure um, and nearest neighbors on that lattice interact. Um, I, I showed some pictures here where they form some kind of a checkerboard order. Um, the nearest neighbors have spins that point up, down, up, down. And that has to do again with sort of the local structure of, of, of interactions between these particles. Um, one of the limitations I would say in experiments to date has to do with kind of the connectivity of how these atoms interact. Um, and in particular, the fact that typically atoms only interact with their neighbors. Um, so one can have direct collisional interactions between these atoms. Um, if the electron is in, the, in an excited state, there can be some long range dipolar interaction or a van der Waals interaction, but still interactions typically decay with distance. Um, so to give a flavor for sort of why that's a limitation, I thought I would give a classical example that we're all familiar with. Um, so the classical example is the internet, right? So um, it's really wonderful that, you know, thanks to the internet and Zoom, um, I actually don't even know where most of you are. Um, it really doesn't matter because we have this sort of network of non-local connectivity where we can all talk to each other and exchange information, right? So that's very different from sort of um, uh, the olden days, um, sometime before I can really remember, um, <laughs> when what matters was, was really physical distance, right? Like if you only talk to your neighbors, the way that um, you know, scientific collaborations form, common wisdom develops, um, would be very different than um, now when what matters is kind of um, just um, who we choose to talk to in this, in this network of non-local connectivity. Um, and frankly, I have to admit, I spend substantially more time talking to some network of physicists delocalized over the globe than um, to my next door neighbor. So um, this is really um, you know, transformative in even just in the classical world. How does it matter in quantum systems? So in quantum systems, in a similar way, um, connectivity matters. So just to give an example, if I have a collection of a set of quantum bits that are arranged on a lattice and nearest neighbors interact, um, that turns out to be a natural way to make a certain quantum state known as a cluster state which is a universal resource for computation in principle, if you can make this well enough. Um, if I have the same type of interaction, but instead of neighbors interacting, every atom interacts with every other, that turns out to be um, precisely what you need to make a certain type of state known as a squeezed state that is a resource for, uh, it's a state with reduced quantum noise that is a resource for enhancing these atomic clocks and other sensors. Um, if every atom talks to every other one, but the interactions are sufficiently random, um, that actually can be a good model for studying a process known as fast scrambling, which is our best model for what happens to information that falls into a black hole. Um, and if you have sufficient programmability of the interactions between a set of qubits, um, then perhaps one can actually take some uh, real world optimization problem and actually map it to the problem um, of minimizing the energy of a particular interacting quantum system that one builds in the lab, and perhaps the quantum system can help you find the solution to your problem. Um, so in several of these examples that I gave, sort of um, the key point and the reason why the structure of interactions matters in quantum systems is that the structure of interactions governs the form of entanglement, of quantum correlations in the system. Okay, so what do I mean by entanglement? Um, I, I thought I would take the opportunity to share um, my brief sort of one and a half video introduction to what I mean by quantum information and entanglement um, that I had the great fortune of having animated recently by a professional animator. So um, here we go. The simplest quantum system is a quantum bit, which like a classical bit can be in the zero state or the one state. The remarkable thing about a quantum bit is that it doesn't need to be in just the zero state or the one state. It can be in what's called a, a superposition of the two. 
fundamentally, it's unknown and unknowable whether the qubit is in the zero state or the one state until a measurement is performed. And when the measurement per is performed, it's almost like it has to decide. So I like to use kind of the analogy of a, a coin, right? A coin is a system with two states, heads and tails. And the superposition is a little bit like a coin that's floating in midair and it hasn't decided whether it's going to land heads or tail. So now the really neat thing though, is that in a quantum system, you can have a phenomenon that's equivalent to me tossing a coin and you tossing a coin, and we repeat this experiment a hundred times, and every time I get heads, you get heads, and every time I get tails, you get tails. But if I look at my tosses alone, the outcome always looks flat random. So there's this randomness, but there are correlations in the randomness. And that tells us that there's some information that I don't have, my coin toss looks random, you don't have it, but when we compare notes, there's actually some information there and not just randomness. So this idea of having information that's encoded in correlations, this is known as entanglement. And this is really the key resource for quantum technologies. Okay, so, so entanglement, this, this fact that we can store information in correlations and not just in, in, in individual particles, that gives rise to the complexity of quantum systems. It's why we can't describe them on classical computers. And it's why we think they should have some power that classical computers don't have. Um, but the structure of these correlations, these correlations need to be formed by interactions. And so to control the structure of these correlations in an efficient way, you would like to be able to control the structure of interactions in your quantum system. Um, and so that's actually um, much of what I'll talk about today is how can we start to control and engineer non-local connectivity um, that is then ultimately a resource for advancing the range of entangled states that one can make. Um, so before I go into um, sort of more about, you know, how do we do this in the lab, I thought I would give kind of one more example of kind of um, why you want, might want to be able to control the structure of interactions um, from this area here of optimization. So um, this, I thought I'd give this example because it's one of the ones you're most likely to encounter if you kind of read it, surf the web and try to figure out what are people trying to use quantum computers for. Um, so you'll find a number of different uh, companies that are promising that they will solve your scheduling and logistics problems, um, uh, optimize the returns on your financial portfolio, um, and perhaps even help you optimize fleet operations for holiday deliveries using their quantum computers. So I, uh, and they're actually, um, and roughly speaking in some form. Um, I think uh, it's all only. Them, what's that? Few possible sorry. places though. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Just a reminder folks, if you are not speaking, go ahead and mute. Okay, so, <laughs> um, right. And there are lots of questions about, um, can quantum systems offer a speed up for these applications? Um, what role does, if any, um, does entanglement play? Um, one of the questions I always had when I sort of read these websites was how do you actually take these problems and map them to a physical model? Um, so I was really happy when I um, learned of a couple of examples that I could relate to. Um, and um, so I'm a professor. So one that I can relate to has to do with um, the problem of scheduling classes. Um, so here's an optimization problem that you might want to solve. Um, I have a bunch of students um, and they need, we need to schedule lectures for these students to take. And in a simple case, imagine that there are just two possible time slots in which these lectures can be scheduled, a morning slot and an afternoon slot. Um, and I would like to schedule the classes so that a student who wants to take two different classes um, has those classes available in two different time slots. Um, so one way I could go about doing this is I could draw a graph where each of the vertices on my graph is a class um, and each of the edges is weighted by the number of people who want to take both of the classes um, that are uh, uh, at the ends of that edge, right? So if lots of people want to take these two classes, I'll draw a heavily weighted edge between them. Um, and now when I, what I want to optimize, right, if lots of people want to take these two classes, I should put them in different time slots. Um, so I can color this graph, graph, red and blue, for the morning and afternoon time slots. And the idea is I want to sort of, again, I want to cut the most heavily weighted edges. I want those to have opposite colors on the graph. So this is known as the max cut problem. Um, it's a problem that does not generically have any efficient solution on a classical computer. If you're a physicist, um, you would think of this red and blue coloring as basically saying, well, these are spins that can point up or down and they should have some anti-ferromagnetic interaction. They want to anti-align if the edge that I've drawn here is very heavy. 
Um, and so this ends up looking like some system of interacting spins or qubits um, where what I would like to do is to minimize the energy. Um, but it's not just spins on a lattice, right? There's some very non-local graph of interactions. Any pair of classes will have generically a bond between it. Um, and so kind of the ingredients that you would need are um, some um, spins or qubits, non-local interactions between them, and the ability also to program the graph of interactions. OK, so um, the non-local interactions, again, are kind of the, the hard part that's not so, so natural to realize in the lab. Um, this is something that we do in our lab by letting, um, essentially letting atoms talk to each other with the aid of light. So the idea is that photons will be able to convey information between distant atoms um, to connect them like these nodes on the internet that I showed before. Um, and the other sort of ingredient is actually we have a high degree of control over laser light in the lab. And so the hope is that by actually controlling some laser light that we send into this system, we will actually be able to control the graph of interactions. OK, so before we get into um, controlling the graph of interactions, let me just give you a flavor of um, more concretely sort of how these atoms interact. So the basic idea is I'll have an atom with two um, uh, states that I, two internal states that I'll label spin up and spin down, whether or not they're physically spin, we can generically, well, I'll give them those names. Um, and the basic idea is that I, what I would like is to have some process where an atom in the spin up state can flip its spin by emitting a photon, and that photon can be absorbed by another atom that flips its spin in turn. And if I can do that, then I'll have some kind of a flip-flop interaction right, between these two atoms. And that interaction can be as long-ranged as sort of I can get the light to travel between these atoms and be reabsorbed efficiently. Um, so the challenge you might worry about is how do I make sure this photon that gets emitted by atom one is reabsorbed by the other atom and doesn't fly off in some random direction. Um, and the way that we address that is actually by um, trapping our atoms in an optical resonator. So it's just two mirrors end to end. Um, when you send in light, it can bounce back and forth many times. And there's constructive interference that enhances the probability that these two atoms within the resonator will talk to each other instead of the photon flying off in a random direction. Um, that general approach is actually applied in a number of different physical platforms. Um, so um, microwave resonators um, are actually used to allow superconducting qubits to talk to each other or, or also quantum dots. Uh, in the domain of optical photons, um, those can be used to interconnect um, solid state spins or in our system, um, uh, optically trapped atoms that are trapped between sort of macroscopic mirrors. Um, one kind of, uh, and it's worth pointing out that sort of ending an application, you might choose different systems. Um, so these superconducting systems are the most, can everyone hear me? It says my internet connection is unstable. Okay. These superconducting systems are the most well-established for quantum computing. Um, the solid state spins are of interest for applications in quantum networks. And um, these systems of, uh, of trapped atoms so far have um, quite a strong track record in areas of quantum sensing and also um, are being explored for simulation. And one of the key things that I'll emphasize again about the atomic system is kind of the scalability. So there are some experiments where people are looking at two individually trapped atoms and implementing quantum gates using light. Um, and then there are experiments where people are working with 100,000 of these atoms and generating entanglement among them in a massively parallel fashion. Um, and so in particular, um, in sort of the regime of tens to hundreds of thousands of atoms, this platform of atoms talking to each other with the aid of photons already has um, quite a strong track record in generating, for example, quantum states of many spins, um, which ordinarily would have some quantum fluctuations in the direction in which the spins point. Um, uh, quantum noise that affects your precision measurement if you're trying to use this system, let's say, in an atomic clock. Um, and one thing that one can do is have interactions generate correlations that sort of, um, in some sense, change the statistics of the coin toss that I can think of when I, when I sort of measure the states of these spins. It's like a coin toss. We can adjust the statistics to reduce the fluctuations by introducing correlations between these, these atoms. Um, and that's something that has applications to enhancing the precision of atomic clocks. So that's a uh, sort of a strong tra track record in, in quantum engineering already. Um, these systems are starting to be applied also in that domain of simulation that I mentioned. So for example, can you use um, uh, a, a lattice formed by um, a standing wave of light in such an optical resonator um, to mimic the crystalline structure of a solid um, and trap atoms in that lattice that behave like electrons in the material 
um, and have the physics of phonons, so have um, um, some modulation of the light field that mimics the modulations of the crystalline structure of the solid. Um, and that actually, that physics of electrons coupled to phonons is important for understanding superconductivity. Um, one of my colleagues is working on understanding, can you mimic that using these systems of atoms um, optically trapped and learn new things by having new observables in the system and new knobs for tuning it. So that's an example of sort of applying these in the area of quantum simulation. Um, one topic I got interested in um, is the question of can you actually build models not only from condensed matter physics, but perhaps also some toy models of quantum gravity, which is certainly something that is normally hard to probe in the lab. Okay, so what, what made me think about that? Um, what first got me interested in this is learning um, about a problem, a phenomenon known as quantum information scrambling. And this had to do with asking the question, what happens to information that falls into a black hole? Um, there was a conundrum that um, it seemed that information is lost, but under quantum mechanics, actually information should never be lost. And the solution seems to be that what happens is that information isn't lost, but it is, so to speak, scrambled. It becomes hidden. Some information that was locally encoded in a particular quantum bit or spin becomes hidden in complex correlations between many of these quantum bits through the influence of interactions. So there's a conjecture that if you have a quantum system that is in some sense the analog of a black hole, information should exponentially quickly become scrambled and hidden in these complex correlations and entanglement in the system. So um, this is interesting, perhaps from the in perspective of understanding quantum gravity, but also because this is conjectured to be a fundamental speed limit on actually the dynamics of any quantum system. And so um, actually having sort of any new insights into what are the rules governing the behaviors of interacting quantum systems um, are valuable because these systems are ones where one actually can't necessarily calculate the behavior. So, you know, when I learned that I was curious, can this process be studied in the lab? And it turns out theorists can write down on paper models that they believe would behave in this way, but they look very weird. They involve things like particles that can hop in a completely non-local and random fashion. Um, which I could never do if, if, you know, what, if the physical system I have are atoms um, hopping in, atoms or electrons hopping in some lattice between neighboring sites. Um, or they look um, local in some way, but in a very strange geometry, like games of billiards on a tree graph can actually behave in this way. Um, so, okay, so can we build any of these things in the lab? Um, okay, I told you that sort of this non-local hopping is something that I wouldn't expect for massive particles. But actually, I also said that if we have spin excitations, those can hop in a way that is mediated by light, right? I said we can turn a spin excitation in one atom into a spin excitation in an atom in a completely different location by letting a photon carry information. Um, so that is something that um, we do in our lab. And the experimental setup um, looks something like this. There's really just two mirrors five centimeters apart. Um, all of this is in, inside a vacuum chamber. Um, and there's a lens below um, that allows us to kind of um, take pictures of the system by sending in light and gathering the fluorescence on a camera. Um, so here's kind of an early picture of just um, a cloud of atoms trapped here between the two mirrors. It's about half a millimeter long. Um, and I should emphasize that within these, between these two mirrors, there's a standing wave of light that really pins the positions of the atoms themselves. So the atoms are kind of locked in place. Um, and as sort of a starting point for doing that, um, one ingredient we need is actually to cool the atoms to low temperature. So before all of this, um, we use what by now is a standard technique of laser cooling that allows us to get the system to some tens of millionths of a degree above absolute zero. So that's kind of the starting point for our experiments. Um, and uh, so, so here what you're seeing is just a cloud of, of laser cooled atoms collecting between the two mirrors. Um, we trap them optically. Um, all of this is part of a larger setup, I should emphasize, that was really you know, designed and built by graduate students, including um, Emily Davis here, who um, is a Hertz fellow, recently received her PhD. She's now a Miller fellow at UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, this is really actually an extraordinary just feat of engineering where um, you know, she had to think about all aspects of um, how do I design um, this resonator um, in a way that is vacuum compatible and mechanically stable and brings the light to a very tight focus, um, designing the entire apparatus around this, including you know, the vacuum system, the laser system, all of the electronics to keep the lasers at exactly the right frequency. Um, and I'll just briefly mention one other person who I had a lot of fun working with on the laser system was uh, Catherine Van Kirk, who's a new Hertz fellow, um, now a PhD student at Harvard. Um, so 
Um, these are complex projects that require really awesome people to get them up and running. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what, what the setup looks like. And once all of that is in place using um, Catherine's laser, um, we can um, drive this process that lets um, spins talk to each other. Um, and we want this process to be optically controllable. So sort of to be concrete, I gave sort of a cartoon picture earlier, to, but to be concrete, there's some laser um, field that we sort of uh, send into the cavity and it drives a process where an atom absorbs a photon from the laser field emits a photon into the cavity, and another atom absorbs that photon from the cavity and re-emits it into the laser field, and in that process, a pair of spins flip. Um, so that means that by turning on and off the laser field, we can also turn on and off the interaction. It's, it's very, it's well controlled. Um, and some of the first data we took with this setup is kind of shown here. Um, so what this is showing is vertical direction is time. The horizontal direction is basically um, uh, position in our cloud of atoms. Um, uh, we initialized the system in this case with some spin excitations in one particular region of this cloud and then watched where they went as a function of time. And you can kind of see them hop over to another region and hop back. Um, uh, you can see some oscillations, which are an indication of coherence in the quantum system. Um, but you can also really strikingly see that these excitations don't just sort of move outwards from this region A to this region B. They kind of suddenly show up somewhere else. And it's an illustration of the kind of no very non-local character of the interaction. Um, and the fact that they show up here is something it turns out we can understand well um, if we know the local density of the atoms and the local intensity of the light field, which happens to be actually strongest in this region B in this particular experiment. I'm going to pause here because I don't like talking to an empty room, and I'm going to ask whether there are any questions about what I've said so far in terms of background and introducing the general experimental platform. You have a question in the chat that. from Brian. Great, yeah. It was just um, that you'd mentioned analog simulation, and it's a little unclear whether you're referring to a simulation of analog processes or analog simulation of processes. Ah, um, I'm not 100% sure what you actually meant by the first one, but what I mean is analog simulation of processes. So, so the okay. idea is rather than trying to build um, you know, a universal computer that can solve every problem, I want to build some system that is um, uh, a model for, for, for a class of problems. So it could be I want to solve problems that I can frame as finding the lowest energy state of an interacting spin system. And so what I would like is some physical incarnation of the spins and some way of controlling their interactions. Or I okay. want to model the physics of electrons in a solid state material. Um, and so what I would like is some fermionic particles that can at least behave in some way like electrons, maybe some control over their interactions, some control over the crystal structure in which these um, particles are trapped, which if you're using atoms to mimic the electrons, the crystalline structure would be provided by light. But the basic concept okay. is build, yeah. And does that, did that answer? So your use of, uh, to some extent, but that's interesting because your use of analog is not what I expected. I was expecting um, a, you know, continuum between zero and one, let's say, but you're saying, Analog simulation really means analogous simulation. Is that a correct inference? Well, OK, so there's another aspect of this that does have to do with the continuum, um, yes. which, which is that um, in sort of digital quantum computing, the idea is um, that I have some sort of discrete set of gates that I can implement. So it's just some, some finite set of specific gates that I can implement. Um, and I want to build a universal, um, I build quantum circuits out of that. Then there's the idea that I'm not implementing individual gates, um, but I have um, some basically Hamiltonian, so I can control, for example, I, I, I might rotate my qubit by an epsilon small amount, as opposed to only rotating by pi by two, rotate, rotating my spin by pi by two. So, so this would be, it would be something where the model is more, I'd have some continuous time evolution um, and I'm controlling some parameters of the system in a continuous way. So in some sense, actually, I'm, maybe I'm using um, <laughs> both aspects of the meaning and conflate. And yeah, but so they're both relevant here. Yeah, and it's interesting yeah. that the qubit, while it has a classically zero or one state, represents a continuum between zero and one when it's in a um, entangled state and it's not um, precipitated out. Yeah, and, and quite and generally, the qubit, in some sense, it is it is intrinsically continuous. So I often I think of the zero state as a spin up, uh, the, or let's say the one state as a spin up, the zero state as a spin down, but the spin actually can point generically anywhere in between. Um, that's 
uh, or equivalently, I think of that as a quantum superposition of the two states. But there's always, just in describing the state of the qubit, it's not just a zero or a one. Um, uh, there's always some, I need, I need a continuum. Uh, I need a continuous number to describe the state because of this phenomenon of superposition. Yeah. Okay, so, so that brings out a much deeper question, and that is I worked with Carver Mead at Caltech on analog computers, and inevitably the problem was the propagation of noise. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, digital systems are great, because if you get 0.9 bits of a one at your receiver, and, you know, you can easily normalize that to one, no problem. But if you do have a continuous system, then how do you uh, manage to extinguish noise or make it tractable so that the analog computer doesn't quickly turn into a random number machine? Yeah, um, so this is a great question. And now I would say this sort of space of problems you might want to solve is large enough that it, it depends a little bit what question you're asking. So sometimes the types of questions people are asking are, what is the phase diagram of some interacting many body system? Um, you know, is, is, is the thing a superconductor or an insulator? Uh, and how does that depend on the structure of interactions? And in those cases, you could imagine there's some robustness in this question of kind of, you know, this is a macroscopic um, property of the system um, where there's some intrinsic robustness that allows you to answer that question potentially, um, uh, as opposed to I'm trying to, um, uh, yeah, so, so, that, so that's a scenario where analog simulation ha has seemed to work well. Um, in other cases where it's something like I'm trying to find, you know, the lowest energy state of this interacting spin system because it solves my um, optimization problem, um, there's, I would say, kind of open questions about what the effects of noise are and um, to what extent there's a quantum advantage. And so I think, you know, these are being addressed on the one hand, um, certainly from the theoretical side, but I would argue also you learn things by building the system and playing with it and seeing like what, what is the actual source of noise and how does one address that. And so I, I think there are lots of important open questions and one of the ways we have to address them is to build the systems and play with them and see what we learn. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I think, um, you know, that noise propagation question would be essential to the general applicability of um, analog computers in this context. So thank you for that, Monica. Absolutely, yes, yeah, really great question. Good. Okay, were there any other questions before I continue? Uh, Dan Goodman had a question, uh, Monica. Uh, Dan, do you wanna go ahead and offer the question? I'll just read my, my chat. Uh, so Monica, earlier on in the presentation, you, um, you listed several applications where quantum computing might be applied. You talked about logistics, optimization, various things. Uh, what makes those uh, applications well suited for quantum computing? Is it just the size of the problem or maybe the fact that the solutions might have, you know, statistically good answers where there's many different choices, you know, you know, kind of lining up with the statistical nature of quantum computing, or is there something else uh, about them? And also kind of where is the state of the affairs with applying, you know, commercially uh, these, these uh, quantum computers to, to such problems? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, I gave those, ex I actually kind of selected those examples. They're not the only ones you would find, but I selected them because those are kind of motivated by this idea that one can naturally map certain of these problems to, so first of all, these problems are generically um, NP hard. Um, so it's, so that, that's kind of why there's an interesting question of can they be done, solved more efficiently um, on quantum computers um, or at least can quant even if, um, the, the absolute best solution, there's some question of, can you find that more efficiently? And if not, can you at least make good heuristic algorithms that are better than classical heuristics? So um, it's basically because they're classically hard is one reason people are interested in them. Um, but also um, they, they sort of map naturally to these interacting spin systems, um, which there are a few different ways being explored of kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, implementing those models and then asking how do you sort of find the lowest energy state? So um, yeah, so I think it's kind of two things. One is that um, there are hard problems classically, but also that there's hope of potentially having near term, so kind of near term algorithms that don't require a full error corrected quantum computer um, because there's kind of a, a hardware efficient mapping um, of, the, of the problem, um, yeah, onto the hardware. Thank you. Yeah, oh, and sorry, in terms of applications, um, I, I would say everything so far is still at the stage of, of 
research, really. Um, so these demonstrations of quantum supremacy were for what's known as a sampling problem, where you can kind of construct a problem that is really designed to be easier on a quantum computer than on a classical one, but it's not necessarily clear what the application is of being able to do that. Um, and so sort of bridging this gap between kind of proof of principle and application is, you know, an ongoing challenge. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's great. So I'll, I'll keep going and I'll, I'll pause again in a little bit. Sorry, I, I don't have a question if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was, it was kind of along the lines of the analog simulation. I guess, so uh, obviously in your, your systems here, you have like these large ensembles of thousands of or hundreds of thousands of, of atoms. Um, normally when people talk about something like uh, quantum supremacy or beyond classical computation, it's these programmable computers where you yeah can you know, like do some thing that you can say from a theoretical computer science perspective that is definitely classically hard. Yes. Um, and I know it's it's widely thought that simulating many body systems is hard to do classically, mostly because we, we don't know how to like create a simulation that, that doesn't require a large Hilbert space. Um, but it, I, I don't quite understand if it's uh, um, like provably hard in the same way or uh, yeah, if it's yeah. that we, we don't know better. <laughs> Yeah, no, so this is a good question. So um, most of what I will show um, today, actually everything I'll show today, we have a pretty good like model that we can write down on paper to actually explain what we measure. So it's in a regime where there's still kind of a semi-classical understanding of the physics. Um, but the, tw and, and that has to do with the fact that we'll be working with um, many atoms. I'll get to sort of on ensembles of atoms that talk to each other, but I won't show anything yet involving, you know, single atoms that are, whose connectivity we can, whose interactions we are controlling. Um, and so there's, I think I would say one of the things we're kind of at this, doing at this stage is building a set of tools that um, there, so, so one question is, can, um, can you take these tools and um, apply them to this regime of individual qubits interacting? And that's something that we're interested in. Although we're also interested in, um, it'll be maybe clearer once I show a little bit um, more of what we're doing in the lab, but we are also interested in asking the question um, in this regime where there are many atoms um, and um, uh, one can nevertheless, as I showed in some of these quantum metrology experiments, provably generate entanglement in the system, can that already be a resource um, for computation? Um, that's also a question that is um, um, worth exploring. So I see. Thanks. Yeah. OK. Um, good. Right. So um, yeah, so actually, maybe I'll just, um, uh, as, as the next step, say sort of what is one, I mentioned kind of entanglement and quantum correlations. What is one way that you um, might expect to generate entanglement in this system? Um, and one way that we've been exploring um, has to do with actually taking advantage of, um, this is actually a richer system than I showed before. So I kind of pretended each atom had two states that I called spin up and spin down. Um, it turns out actually each atom has um, three internal states, which, which I will now call minus one, zero, and one. Um, so you can think of that as um, having, you know, um, uh, each of these going from minus one to zero or zero to one corresponds to adding one additional excitation to the atom. Um, and one of the things we can do in this system is, for example, have um, if you have um, two atoms, each of which um, is in the zero state, um, this uh, process, this kind of flip-flop process, right, where one spin gets flipped up and one spin gets flipped down, in this three-level system corresponds to turning two zero atoms into a plus one and a minus one atom. So I've kind of shown that schematically here. Um, and so you can kind of start to see that this type of a process, if I did it with two atoms, would give me um, a quantum state where I know one atom is in the minus one state, one atom is in the plus state, but I have no idea which is in which state. So that would be an entangled state. Um, in our ensemble of many atoms, um, what we see when we start with all of the atoms in the zero state and turn on the interactions, um, here's actually just sort of 100 repetitions of an experiment where we did that. Um, and what you'll see are kind of, um, so again, so these are pictures of how many atoms are in the minus one state, the zero state, and the plus one state. Um, the different rows of the pictures are different iterations of the experiment. And the first thing you'll see are sort of large fluctuations. Um, sometimes there are um, very few atoms in uh, the zero state, sometimes there are many. But when there are atoms in the minus one and the plus one states, these populations seem to be correlated, right? So you always see these correlations between the number, like here there are more atoms in the minus one state and also more atoms in the plus one state. And that is consistent with this process of sort of generating correlated atom pairs, turning pairs of zero atoms into pairs of plus and minus one atoms. This is kind of a signature of a process 
um, of, of pair creation that has been um, studied actually in a few other physical systems. So there are systems where atoms, um, ultra cold atoms have collisional interactions that give you the plus one minus one pairs. And here these quantum states have been thoroughly characterized and shown to have actually entanglement that's useful for enhancing precision measurements. Um, it's also similar to creating entangled photon pairs in quantum optics. Um, so this is a mechanism for generating entanglement in, by these light mediated interactions in our um, three level system here, which is something that has some advantages compared to what's previously been studied in the sense that because these interactions are optically controlled, you can turn these interactions on with laser light, um, we can start to ask, can we start to program the spatial structure of the interactions and the resulting quantum correlations? Um, and so in order to kind of ask that question cleanly, the physical system we're currently working with is one where we have an array of little ensembles. So um, some thousands of atoms is in each of these um, bright spots here. Um, we have typically, let's say, 18 of these little clouds of atoms. And we've started to ask the question, how far can we come in terms of controlling the graph of interactions between these different nodes? Um, the reason we work with many atoms right now is that actually it does give us a collective enhancement in the strength of interactions that's beneficial for our experiments. Um, so we have these, these, these uh, ensembles and you know, ideally we would maybe make arbitrary graphs of interactions, but a little bit more modestly we'll say, can we at least control the dependence of interactions on distance as a starting point? Um, and in the simplest case, so again, all of these ensembles are trapped within a single optical resonator. Light can travel between any pair of atoms here. And in the simplest case, every atom would talk to every other. Um, and that's actually why on the previous slide, you saw sort of correlations across the entire cloud of atoms. Um, but now what we would like is to control which atoms talk to which others. And so it turns out a way we can do that as a first step is to apply a magnetic field gradient across this system. Um, so remember the basic physics was with these two zero atoms that turn into a plus one and a minus one atom. But the plus one and the minus one states, their energies are shifted in the magnetic field. And so if we apply this gradient, there's an energy cost to creating a plus one and a minus one atom um, if they're some distance apart. So if, if they're, if they're at this, on the same site, I can create this pair. But if they're separated by some distance, there's an energy cost, um, which is proportional to the difference in magnetic field at those two sites. And so that means that actually, if we look at the correlations in the system, so what do we look at? So we measure basically, um, we repeat this experiment many times. We measure. Um, what is the correlation between the population in the plus one state on site I and the population in the minus one state on site J? And we see that the correlation is high only kind of on the diagonal. So that's just indicating these pairs are only forming locally. But now we can actually um, controllably turn on interactions at a specified distance by driving the system not with a single laser frequency, but two laser frequencies. So the idea is now we can absorb a photon of one energy and emit a photon of another energy. And that will actually bridge that energy cost of creating a plus one minus one pair at some distance. And so by turning on, essentially by modulating the laser field that we send in so that it has two frequency components, we can turn on interactions at a distance that corresponds to the modulation frequency. Okay, and, and so you can just to sort of summarize that, here's a plot where horizontally I'm showing the strength of correlation as in color versus distance between sites. And vertically, I'm showing the frequency with which I'm modulating my laser field. And you can see that in our case, there's always an on-site interaction. So you can always prepare pairs locally, generate pairs locally. But there's also at an interaction at some particular distance that tracks the frequency with which I modulate the laser field. So that allows us to controllably turn on interactions. Um, and it's really fine control. Like we can dictate by the laser frequency, do I have interactions at a distance of 10 sites or 11 sites or 12 sites? Um, so this generalizes. It's actually very easy to modulate a laser field in any way I want to have sort of an arbitrary spectrum of my laser field. And that in general then lets you have sort of arbitrary dependence of the interactions on, on distance. So let's see a couple of examples of that. Um, one neat thing you can do um, is what happens if in addition, instead of just modulating at one particular frequency, I also pulse the field at a higher frequency. It turns out that what this does is add um, these higher frequency components allow me to have not just, let's say, nearest neighbor interactions, but then also connect um, the ends of my chain. 
So it turns out that this additional pulsing allows us in any system we, we, we build to add, add in effectively periodic boundary conditions, where rather than having sort of um, the structure of interactions match the physical geometry of this chain of sites, we actually have the structure of interactions as if the, um, the, these clouds of atoms were situated on a ring. Um, so this starts to kind of show that you can have some interaction graph whose geometry is very different from the physical geometry in the lab just by controlling the laser field. Um, so again, the way I'm seeing this here is I see like if I turn on interactions at a distance of two sites, that's, that's the second row here, I also have a distance of the length of chain minus two sites. I see correlations there. Um, you can actually, my students pointed out, um, let's actually ask the question, can we take our measured data and in a black box way, just verify that we really have this sort of new geometry just from the measured spin correlations? Um, so you know, we drive the system in a certain way. In this case, we're trying to form nearest neighbor interactions and periodic boundary conditions. Um, and if you adopt some ansatz that um, I'm going to interpret my measured correlations as decay as correlations between some sites that decay with distance in some effective geometry, um, you ask what is the best fit embedding of the sites in three dimensions to explain those correlations. In fact, it looks a lot like a ring. Um, and so one thing that my students have done here is they've really colored there are you know, n sites, there are order n squared bonds you could imagine drawing. And they've really colored each bond according to the um, strength of correlation between those sites. Um, in fact, it turns out you take the correlation matrix and you invert it, and that gives you an ansatz for the coupling between sites i and j. Um, and it really, uh, what pops out is this ring, right? There are n squared possible bonds, but what pops out is this ring. So this kind of verifies that we've made the graph we think we've made. Um, and now you can kind of apply that you know, to a few other examples. So if I have open boundary conditions and interactions between third neighbors and I do this reconstruction, you can think about this and ask what will pop out if I ask what is the best fit geometry in three dimensions. Um, what pops out are three decoupled chains. And that kind of makes sense because um, I could have redrawn the graph in, in this other way. Um, so now we can be a little fancier and say, let's have nearest neighbor interactions, periodic boundary conditions. But while we're at it, let's also draw connections across the ring. So, um, and it turns out actually, I can also control the sign of the interaction. That turns out to just be the phase of my modulation at a given frequency. So in this case, we said, let's have ferromagnetic interactions between nearest neighbors, anti-ferromagnetic interactions across the ring. Um, and, you know, we do an experiment where we measure the correlations in the system and reconstruct the geometry. Actually, can anyone guess what will pop out when I try to reconstruct this geometry in three dimensions? It's a quiz to see whether anyone's awake. When you say three dimensions, what are you referring to? Um, so in the left plot here, I, I basically asked, um, what is, um, what is the right way to think about the geometry of the, of the system? Uh, I say, you know, I adopt some ansatz that the correlations decay as a function of distance between some effective coordinates. And what popped out was that I should think of this as three independent chains, even though physically what I had is a single long chain in the lab. Um, so similarly here, I can ask what is um, the best fit embedding of these sites into some three-dimensional space to explain the correlations that I measured. When you say best embedding, are you referring yeah. to most compact or most usable or some, what's the metric um, for best? That's a good question. So um, we take some ansatz that correlations should decay as a function of an effective distance, um, which is distance between some coordinates that I'm trying to find. And um, for our system, it turns out to be natural to take the ansatz that it's a Gaussian decay, but the precise form of the decay isn't so important. So that means actually from the measured correlations, I can actually extract an effective distance and I can ask, is there a way I can position these sites in three dimensions so that the distances match the distances that these correlations indicate? And so, so it's a way of sort of saying, you know, what is the right way to think about the graph I've created? Is there a ge geometrical picture for this graph I've created? So Monica, yeah. Alex put in the chat, he's, um, he's suggesting a sphere. A sphere, um, not quite, but um, I can sort of see why you might think a sphere because, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's not just a ring. There are some extra connections that maybe um, um, change the way the thing looks in 3D. Okay, so I'm happy that at least somebody gave a guess. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and show the answer. So this is actually a Mobius strip. Um, 
So, so why is it a Mobius strip? So if you sort of, again, we have these kind of nearest neighbor interactions physically, which are, are this red ring here. Um, and those correspond to basically going once around the single edge of the strip. Um, but these bonds across the ring, these are kind of these, these blue legs here, um, that is the width of the strip. Um, so this is just, uh, you, again, this is just a different way of, of showing the same graph. This graph is actually, it has the name, it's, it's called a Mobius ladder. Um, and uh, yeah, and so kind of even though physically our, our, our system is, is this array of, of sites positioned in one dimension, effectively by controlling the interactions, we've made something that looks like a Mobius strip, which is sort of less natural to maybe make by other methods. Um, and the other neat thing is, again, just by controlling the sign of a modulation or the phase of a modulation, we can control the sign of the interactions. And that shows up as these um, anti-ferromagnetic correlations, let's say, um, uh, sort of across the width of the strip. Um, physically, you can think of this as indicating that sort of we have formed some spin texture where neighboring spins are almost aligned, but as you sort of go once around the edge of the strip or around that wheel, um, there must be some kind of a winding to explain the anti-ferromagnetic correlation on the blue bonds. Okay. So um, neat. So, so this kind of gives some idea of, you know, having some control over the graph of interactions, the sign of interactions. One thing that is actually not at all obvious um, is <laughs> why. Was there a question? Um, yes, uh, Monica, I had a quick question. I'm thinking about, in thinking about the physics of these cavities where you've got uh, atoms and photons, <laughs> Yeah, the, the controlling photons that you're using to control the interactions among and those are <clears throat> those are being absorbed and being emitted by uh, by atoms. And it would seem to me that the um, the coherence, the potential coherence among the photons is going to be a very important part of this and so you know coherent states of the photons and the so the correlation among the photons and the correlations among the atoms are intimately related and i wonder if you could just say a few words about that because it's kind of confusing yes. yeah that's a great question so um one of the things you might actually um worry about depending what you're trying to do is that I'm sending in light and the light eventually also leaves the system. And to the extent that the light is correlated with the atoms, that there's some sort of information about my quantum system that might leak away to an outside observer. And um, that can be a source of kind of decoherence, right? If there's information between the photons shared between the photons and the atoms um, and the photons leave the system. Um, so I, I, it could be useful. Sometimes people use these systems to look at the outgoing light to learn something about the system. Um, but if you want to sort of have coherent quantum dynamics, you actually have to be careful about ensuring that any light leaks away doesn't carry information about the atomic system. Um, so it turns out there's kind of a figure of merit for being able to do that. Um, it's called the cooperativity. And it basically says, what's the probability that a photon emitted by one atom interacts, uh, is scattered into this resonator mode as opposed to leaving either by spontaneous emission or leaking out through the mirror. Um, if that number is large, then you can actually have coherent interactions between the atoms with little information leaking to the outside world. Um, in our case, that figure of merit for a single atom is larger than one, it's around five, but it's not way larger than one. Um, and so this is actually a reason why we're currently working with these sort of little clouds of atoms um, that have an, a collectively enhanced cooperativity. So this figure of merit is 10,000. Um, and so that kind of helps us have information kind of discreetly shared between the atoms without um, that information leaking away. So, so the light field can be operating in a regime where there's sort of minimal information on the light that leaks out. Um, and what, sort of one of the sort of interesting questions and directions with the system is, um, can we push up that figure of merit to the point where we have you know, single atoms that are interacting? Um, as I said, it, it is in what's known as the strong coupling regime, but it's not deep in that regime currently. And partly that's because our mirrors are dirty so we can clean them and that would win us already substantial factor. Um, but, but then there's, um, yeah, sort of other, other directions one can go beyond that. So did that answer your question and maybe more than yeah, answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, very good question. Um, 
Okay, so one thing that's not really obvious actually um, about what I've shown you so far is I told you, you know, we can control the sign of the interactions. We see the sign of the correlations kind of match that. Um, but it's actually not, this isn't a system where we intentionally like prepared the ground state of this interacting system. All we did was sort of turn on the light and measure the correlation at some later time. And so it's actually somewhat surprising that what I showed you is when we have anti-ferromagnetic interactions, we see evidence that the spins have anti-ferromagnetic correlations, that they're anti-aligned. Um, so why is that happening? So it turns out, um, hmm, okay. It turns out, let me just go ahead to this. So it turns out that actually this process of generating these correlated pairs actually allows you to sort of trade off um, the internal state energy for the interaction energy. So what's happening is as we generate these pairs in the plus and minus one states, actually there's an energy cost to having a plus minus one pair compared to an atoms in the zero state. Um, and we make up for that by actually lowering the interaction energy of the system. And so that's actually interesting because just dynamically by turning on the light field, you can actually kind of make low energy states of this interacting spin system. Um, so for example, if we have something that's, you know, a triangular anti-ferromagnetic ladder, this is kind of a model for what's known as, what's known as frustration. Um, ideally, any neighboring pair of spins would like to anti-align, but on the triangle, they can't all be perfectly anti-aligned. Um, uh, so the best thing they can do in this example is form some sort of 120 degree order. Um, um, and we see evidence that that happens in our system. Um, but more generally, this sort of frustration is the key ingredient for these kind of hard optimization problems that I mentioned earlier. And so an interesting question for us is, can we harness this sort of mechanism where the system naturally kind of lowers its interaction energy as a function of time um, as a way of actually perhaps preparing low energy states of interacting spin systems that map onto these hard optimization problems. So that's a direction we would love to take this. Um, one thing that is um, useful for that is sort of the versatile control we have over the graph of interactions. And again, these are just, this is kind of a gallery of a few different things we've done just by driving the system with different waveforms of the light. Um, I showed you the Mobius strip, it can also be a cylinder without the twist. We can have flexible control over the sign or the interactions, ferromagnetic, anti-ferromagnetic, or is there some of both, which can also be an ingredient for these frustrated interactions. Uh, Mom, you have a question in the chat. Yeah. Ryan? Um, yeah, it's more of a general question. Um, didn't mean to interrupt the flow at all, but um, interested in you know extending this to three D lattices. To what to what extent, in principle, could you actively control or arbitrarily control the connectivity matrix of cold atom traps in diverse locations, perhaps in very distant portions of the matrix, and could it become arbitrarily control? with uh, suitable laser um, stimulation? Yeah, so um, I think first of all, a point I want to make is that um, if you have arbitrary control, then you basically have um, the, the there's sort of the question of where the atoms are actually trapped and are they trapped in a 1D lattice or a 3D lattice ends up sort of not mattering because the effective geometry can be totally different from the physical geometry. The one sense in which the physical geometry matters is that in a given volume, it's of course easier to pack kind of more atoms into 3D than into 1D. Um, so already in our, in our system, roughly speaking, kind of we have this 1D system, but we make these effectively kind of, you know, two-dimensional manifolds here. And I guess it's sort of embedded in 3D, but it's still kind of 2D in the example of this Mobius strip. Um, we make those by sort of adding interactions at sort of different, each distance, at which we add an interaction, at which we turn on interactions, can give rise to kind of an effective added dimension. Um, and I'll show one thing that's effectively even higher dimensional. But probably right now in this system, the main limit is that probably realistically what we can fit into kind of the volume of our cavity is about 100 sites. So then if you could go into the transverse direction, you can um, increase that somewhat. Um, and so that might be a motivation to go to higher dimensions. And then one has, one has to think, of, I think there are tricks that one could use, um, but certainly it's most naturally works in one dimension, so. Very well, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, the other thing I'll maybe just add is we're not yet taking advantage. In principle, you could address from the side um, uh, with the light that drives the interactions could be controlled from the side. And that gives even more arbitrary control 
Um, but there are sort of technical reasons why it's advantageous to uniformly address with a single laser and just use the frequency control of the frequency spectrum to control the graph. Um, so yeah, but I think there's, there's more one can do if you want to push it. Um, okay, so let me, so I'll just pause at this point and, and say I've already kind of shown you that these programmable couplings let us reach, you know, quite exotic geometries, non-trivial topologies, um, this phenomenon of frustration that's relevant to these hard optimization problems. Um, some of what we've, like ladder graphs, you could also do in other platforms where one just has local interactions. Um, and in fact, I would say part of what, what we've shown here is kind of inspired by examples of things that have been done in other platforms like atoms and, and optical lattices with local interactions. So we really wanted to do sort of one thing that um, starts to explore um, something that's really non-local that you can't do in any other way. Um, and so with sort of that in mind, um, we started to explore this direction of can we build some toy models of quantum gravity? Um, I was going to pause here for questions, but I just took a couple of questions. So sh should I take more or should I keep moving? Are there additional questions people want to jump in with? I actually do have a quick question. You talked about a little bit the um, this frequency modulated uh, scheme that you have for coupling, which it seems really awesome that it's so simple. Uh, but I'm interested in your comparison between that and maybe more uh, complex techniques with uh, Rydberg atoms where you have to have site selectivity? Yeah. So one thing I'll mention actually is, so in this system, we do actually also have site selectivity, not in turning on the interactions, but in um, doing any sort of spin rotation. And that's actually important for the measurements we do of the correlations. And so we actually, I, I was impressed by the sophistication with which my students were able to basically um, have the system interact and then locally address with a laser beam that sort of scans across the system and does different rotations on each site um, to measure these spin correlations. Anyway, so that's so that's to say, um, I think no matter what sort of local addressing is something that you kind of want, want to have um, in any of these simulation platforms. Um, with Rydberg atoms, um, there's a fair amount you can do with local addressing, um, certainly like um, controlling kind of which atoms interact. If you want to get to the point where you sort of make more complex graphs of interactions that don't naturally sort of fit into, um, let's say, 2D, um, maybe 3D, um, then you need to um, sort of play some fancier games like moving the atoms around. So in principle, you can do anything if you um, have local interactions plus the ability to change, you know, which atoms are neighbors. Um, you can't necessarily do it efficiently, right? So that's sort of one one potential issue is that moving things around is, um, yeah, is not necessarily a fast thing to do and could be an extra source of decoherence. Um, but the that I, I think is also a, promise, a promising direction. I know there's some sort of really cutting edge work going on in doing that. Um, and um, I would say it's kind of, um, at this point, maybe an open question whether that's you know sufficient or whether that's too slow in order to sort of efficiently build up entanglement in the ways that you might like um, or or efficiently naturally um, impose. Let, maybe I'll put it this way: if you want to sort of have an analog simulation where you build a, some complex graph of interactions um, and ask, "Can I drive my system into the ground state of that?" Um, for that, it doesn't seem like it's very natural to have to sort of shuffle the atoms around every time you want to sort of mimic a non-local interaction. You would like it to be kind of physically there. Um, so yeah, I think it depends now a little bit on what you're trying to do. So if you're really trying to sim simulate a model with non-local interactions, it feels like some sort of direct non-local coupling like the photons give you is a nice thing to have. But um, the challenge is it's not yet at the le same level of, you know, the coherence of a gate mediated by photons is not as high at the current state of the art as what you can do um, with direct um, interactions, let's say, between Rydberg atoms. So right now, I would say each of the platforms has its advantages, and maybe one day this will all actually come together. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's, um, let's see one more kind of um, fun thing we can do with this. So. Um, I sort of mentioned earlier that I had gotten interested in quantum gravity after hearing this story about fast scrambling, which requires non-local interactions. I don't actually know much at all about gravity myself. Um, and so I was very fortunate um, as I was sort of trying to learn more about 
um, sort of what would be interesting to simulate relevant to gravity um, to have the opportunity to collaborate with Steve Gubser, um, who um, was really an, an expert thinking deeply about ways of understanding, for example, what is the mathematical um, structure behind the reality that we experience as smooth space time, but which we have reason to believe is fundamentally discrete because of the existence of quantum mechanics and the Planck length as a shortest length scale. Um, and Steve was investigating, um, or had actually come up with a model um, uh, in which essentially gra a discretized model of gravity, um, where curved space is represented by a tree graph. Um, and so, so why a tree graph? So if I have um, a, a true sort of a binary tree like this, um, the depth of the tree, if the tree has n sites and leaves, then the depth of the tree is log n. Um, I, I kind of showed it here in a different way where it's wrapped around with periodic boundary conditions, but you can kind of see here if the circumference is n and the radius is log n, then this is actually a space with negative curvature. So this is some discretized model of actually hyperbolic space. Um, so it's a discretized model of curved space and gravity. Um, and it's also a model for what's known as holographic duality. So this is the concept um, that actually, in certain cases, you might have a physical system, let's say really like a quantum mechanical system that lives on these end sites on the boundary. Um, that's the part that's physical. Um, but the best description of the correlations in that system are actually, is actually in terms of some additional dimension um, whose geometry captures something about the structure of the quantum correlations. So the concept is, um, uh, in certain cases, one has sort of a higher dimension that emerges as a natural description of the physical system. Um, and that um, higher dimension can have curvature. Um, and perhaps one question that theorists think deeply about is, is this actually how space-time curvature and gravity emerge in our world? Is this really a phenomenon that em emerges at its root from quantum correlations and entanglement? Okay, so um, I was curious, you know, can we build something like this in the lab where there's a physical system that lives on the boundary, but there's some natural description in terms of a higher dimensional um, geometry or graph. And actually there are people who build, for example, with networks of superconducting resonators sort of build up physically hyperbolic geometries in the lab. Um, but what we were thinking about is, can you do this, um, build a system where this, there's this notion of emergence that I don't build in an extra dimension, um, but it's the right discretion of the quantum correlations in my system. Um, and so in collaboration with, with Steve Gubser, we had written down on paper a model um, that seemed like it might behave in this way. Um, but it was sort of a weird model with non-local interactions. So the idea is you have a chain of sites, you have interactions that are at distances that are powers of two. Um, and there's some exponent that governs whether the interactions shrink or grow as a function of distance. So if they shrink, then it's not too different from a system with just nearest neighbor interactions. So like a, a, a chain or, a, or, or a ring, if you have periodic boundary conditions, um, that would be one limit where this exponent is less than zero. But in the other limit where the exponent is greater than zero, um, the geometry, the right way of thinking about the system is gonna be very different. And the conjecture is that the right way of thinking about it is as if the sites on this in the physical system were nodes on, on a tree graph. Okay. So we were curious, you know, can we build that in the lab? So the ingredients are interactions at distances that are power of two with powers of two, and they should grow with distance. So, you know, we can do that with our scheme. We appropriately modulate the laser field. We measure the correlations in this system. The correlations we measure have some weird non-monotonic structure. They're strong at distances that are powers of two, um, as you might expect. Um, and if you want to see whether what we've done is built the tree graph, then the right thing to do is actually to plot these correlations in sort of a reorganized form, which has to do with sort of where does this tree graph come from? So the idea is basically with the structure of interactions, the weakest links in the chain are between the even and odd sites. So those are kind of the two halves of the tree. And more generally, if I want to sort of find where a site is on the tree, I'll look at the least significant bit, I'll go either left or right. Um, and then at progressive levels of the tree, I'll look at progressively more significant bits. So there's a mapping. So the mapping actually to get from position in the physical chain to position on the tree involves reversing the order of the bits and the site. And if you do that, then this correlation plot starts to look a lot more structured. It has a kind of a hierarchical block structure that has to do with the levels of the tree. And if you look at the strength of correlation as a function of distance in the tree graph, um, correlations actually decay kind of monotonically with distance. So this shows that we have this sort of tree-like effective geometry 
Um, and we can take it one step further and ask, you know, earlier I reconstructed some geometries like the Mobius strip. Those were really like the geometry of the physical graph, graph that we wired into the system. But now can we reconstruct this idea of an emergent geometry that captures the structure of the correlations in the system? So we can first um, do what I did before, sort of just from the measured spin correlations, ask what is the best fit embedding of the sites? In this case, we did it in two dimensions. Um, and I'm doing it here in two cases where the one where interactions decay with distance and the geometry should be similar to the physical geometry, the one where they grow with distance and um, we think we should have something like the tree. And what we do to check that is we essentially adopt some coarse graining procedure where we look at which are the most strongly correlated sites and we draw bonds between them. And then we treat those as a single larger site and draw progressively um, more bonds until everything is connected. And if you adopt this coarse graining procedure, then what you actually see emerge um, from these bonds that indicate where are the co strongest correlations is precisely this tree structure. And so this is really a sort of a nice example of a case where we have uh, this, this quantum system that lives on the boundary. These are the sites shown in gray, but the right description is in terms of um, some emergent um, bulk geometry, which in this case is, is the tree graph. Okay, um, and one other kind of neat thing about this, just as you tune a single parameter, you're kind of tuning between two completely different geometries, the linear chain and the tree. Um, and at some point in between, where all of the interactions at these di different distances are equally strong, it turns out there's no way to cut the system so that two halves of the system are uncorrelated. Um, so you can ask sort of the, these purple points here are sort of, if I cut the system in half and I consider all possible ways of cutting the system in half, how strong is the correlation between the two halves? And if I'm either in the linear regime or the tree-like regime, which are these values S equals zero and minus one, then there's some way of cutting the system so that the two halves are weakly correlated. Um, but then there's this regime in between where everything is sort of strongly connected to everything and this is potentially an ideal condition for studying this sort of black hole like fast scrambling. Um, so that's kind of the conjecture is that at this point in between, the system might behave like a black hole with this exponentially fast spreading of information from one to many. So that's something we would love to look at in the future. Um, for now, I'll just wrap up and say that um, we have really realized the system with a high degree of programmability of the graph of interactions, the sign of the interactions, um, uh, the geometry, the topology. Um, I, you can even control the form of the interactions. Is it these spin exchanges? Are they the Ising interactions I mentioned earlier in the context of optimization problems where spins want to align or anti-align? I see a question, but I'm almost on the last slide, so I'll just wrap up and then I'll take questions. Um, so, so we're excited to kind of apply this toolbox. Um, um, on the one hand, going deeper into this direction of, of quantum simulation, um, exploring um, uh, can, are there other you know, systems one can realize where this notion of holographic duality and emergent ge geometry is a good description, um, where perhaps we don't know a priori what we will expect to measure. Um, and can you apply these anti-ferromagnetic and sign-changing interactions to realize models that map onto hard optimization problems and use the quantum dynamics to solve them? And I'll just say it's an open question whether you know, this mechanism that we have in our system that seems to give low energy spin configurations um, actually gives a quantum advantage for solving, for solving such problems. Um, but one of the things you have to do is play with in the lab. I'll also just advertise that um, at the same time, theoretically, we've been thinking about um, what is a way that you could um, sort of provably get a quantum advantage um, for solving a certain one of these optimization problems. Um, and there's a known quantum algorithm that could be natural to implement in some of these um, physical spin systems we can realize in the lab that would let you apply, that would let you achieve a speed up for a certain class of optimization problems. And that's also something we're interested in exploring. Okay, so with that, I will just um, conclude and, and thank my group. These are some of the people. Um, uh, Emily Davis here is a Hertz fellow. Uh, Catherine Van Kirk is a Hertz fellow. So it's been really wonderful getting to work with those as well as this team, um, Eric, Avatar, and Philip in particular, who did most of the experiment, most recent experiments that I presented. Um, there's a question from Brian. Ahead, yes, Brian. thank you, Monica. Um, so I'm interested in, uh, first of all, if you can make these um, laser wells propagate, um, exist in two dimensions. So you could create a two-dimensional lattice of laser wells for cold atoms. And then secondly, what would the barriers be to creating arbitrary connectivity matrices 
across that two-dimensional lattice. Yeah, so um, certainly there are numerous experiments that actually trap atoms in two dimensions. Um, so e either using standing waves of inter um, standing waves of light that generate a two dimensional lattice or individual tweezer traps that hold the atoms in, in two dimensions. Um, and so so in terms of the trapping that that can be done, um, the main issue is that typically those experiments use either direct collisional interactions between sort of atoms that um, can sit on the same site of the lattice. Um, or uh, another approach that I was mentioning early on in an answer to one of the questions is exciting atoms to Rydberg states that have some van der Waals interactions that still decay with distance. So then the question is, can you combine sort of the methods that we have here um, with those types of systems to have longer range arbitrary connectivity? Um, and so um, the, in some sense, again, for us, it's natural to position the atoms in one dimension. Um, and control the connectivity. And if you have arbitrary control, it actually doesn't matter where the atoms are physically located. Um, scaling, if you want to sort of scale to higher dimensions, so I would actually say sort of the bigger issue for us is not the dimensionality, but sort of asking how coherent can you make the inter interactions between individual atoms. Um, and that's something where I mentioned before, there's a figure of merit that's sort of the strength of the atom light coupling that is larger than one, but not way larger than one in our system. And one thing we're actually really interested in doing, this is kind of a next generation project that, that's at the early, an early stage in our lab, is actually adopting a different type of cavity technology that would more naturally let you combine some of what's currently being done with arrays of Rydberg atoms with additional tools for engineering non-local connectivity. Um, and so um, it turns out um, we're using optical photons right now, but one interesting direction that we're exploring is actually um, using millimeter wave photons um, that um, involves superconducting resonators, which can have a very high quality factor um, and that naturally couple to actually um, Rydberg states, which are already used in some of the um, experiments I showed early on, where there's been high gate fidelities for, for sort of local gates. So I think that there are kind of a few different directions this can go, um, um, some of which are natural to combine potentially with two dimensional arrays. Um, maybe I'll, in that latter approach, the wavelength is longer. The wavelength is sort of millimeter scale. So in terms of sort of the number of atoms you can pack into a wavelength, it's more. And that is relevant for sort of how many atoms you can have in a regime where the atom photon coupling is. Strong. So that's great. That, that and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So are you seeing more promise for wells that are containing one atom or 10 to the fourth atoms? Because it seems like you're getting more signal perhaps in a larger system. Is it fair to say that? you're getting better correlation uh, across these uh, excited um, connectivity elements? Okay, so I think now this um, d depends on what you want to do. So for us, it's, you know, it gives us more signal and it also gives us a collective enhancement of the interaction strength. Um, uh, what the types of, so, so now what do you want to do with this? Um, I mentioned this possible direction in optimization. And I think there it's an interesting question whether you can kind of use these collective dynamics that give you low energy states of the classical spin model that, um, that certain optimization problems map to. So there, I think there's potentially an interesting opportunity to harness the collective dynamics. If you really want kind of like very well controlled generation of entanglement between individual atoms um, to sort of implement kind of more you know, traditional quantum, quantum algorithms where people are thinking, oh, what can you do with single, single qubits? Um, that, you know, then many is not the right way to go. And then in our system, um, one has to optimize things to really push up the strength of, of interaction between individual atoms and the interaction to decay ratio there. So it really depends what you want to do. We're also interested in kind of um, this direction of harnessing entanglement for quantum sensing or um, enhanced clocks. This is something where so far everything that's been done is entangling one large cloud of atoms. There might be benefits to having actually control of entanglement with some spatial structure. And there, in these metrology applications, having many atoms is good for signal to noise, again. And so being able to generate complex entangled states of many atoms is, is, is interesting. But again, I think so, so both directions are interesting in my mind. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yes. Uh, Monica, um, the, um, it would seem uh, as kind of a follow on to my previous question, it would seem that any stable state, like uh, a stable state of atoms, like your, uh, your trees, uh, 
would have um, a, um, a would correspond to a specific coherent uh, uh, state of the uh, photon fields. So um, would it be possible and or is it at all reasonable to just look at the uh, the photon fields as a way of uh, interrogating the uh, the state as you uh, as you look at them. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, it does make sense. So it turns out um, there's kind of a parameter we can tune that dictates the ratio of sort of how much information is just shared between the atoms to how much leaks out of the cavity, and that's essentially a detuning from cavity resonance of our, our drive field. Um, so we tend to work in a regime where we intentionally minimize the amount of information that leaks out of the cavity um, by working at a relatively large detuning from resonance. Um, so there's always light that leaks out, but we take pain so that there's no information about the atomic state imprinted on the light. And that's because we don't want to sort of disturb the quantum coherence of the system. But now you could intentionally send in light that is um, closer to resonance and that's in a regime where we're getting information about perhaps after we prepare our state in order to probe it or even during the process of preparing the state. So one of the interesting things is that when there's information that leaks out of the resonator, it's not information about any one atom, it's collective information about the system as a whole. And yeah. so it is possible to actually get information out um, that nevertheless sort of preserves entanglement in the system um, that projects the atomic system into a particular entangled state because you know something about the state of the sort of collective state, but not about the individual atoms. So there's really, I think, interesting directions that are working more in the regime where the light field is carrying information out. There are questions about, can you prepare um, steady states of the system, even though it's an open system and there's information leaking out that have entanglement? Um, and again, as you said, can you look at the light field and learn something? So we um, intentionally have kind of worked in a regime where the light doesn't carry much information away, but I think the opposite regime is also an interesting one that could be explored. 